Okay, so I'm not sure if this is a shedlet or a shedet or what. It's really actually a short reflection, which I gave last Sunday in, uh, in a church, via Zoom of course, in a beautiful little Devonshire village called East Anstey, where we have some very good friends. And um, I thought that I'd like to uh, record it here at the shed and uh, make it available to all of you, to a wider bunch of people. It was a pretty special Sunday for me, actually, last Sunday, because it's precisely 10 years ago on that, the second Sunday of Advent, that I preached my first sermon after recovering from a heart attack in mid-October 2010. It's interesting, you know, that the expression heart attack is a bit like the word cancer. We don't really too much like to say it, so I discovered. Because uh, among the huge numbers of lovely messages and get well cards that I received back then, very few of them mentioned the dreaded phrase, heart attack. People expressed sorrow that I'd been ill or not well, or they said they were sorry about my scare. <laughs> One card actually said, we're sorry you've been under the weather lately. <laughs> I guess it's how most of us are really. We, we try to avoid pain and painful subjects. I know I do. Doctors, on the other hand, are a lot less di diplomatic. You've had a heart attack, Mr. Tomlinson, the cardiac consultant told me the following morning, very bluntly. And it was a shock, to say the least. You know, because heart attacks happen to other people, not me. I mean, this was only the second time I had been admitted to hospital in my, hospital in my entire life. And the first was for, for dental surgery. So yeah, it was a shock. And look, when we experience something challenging or scary, like a heart attack or a relationship breakdown or financial devastation or a pandemic, uh, we've got a choice either to just carry on, to march on regardless, or to step back and reflect. What does this mean? What does it say about my life, my priorities, my plans? The Christian calendar contains key moments and seasons in which a similar reflective process is meant to occur. Lent is the most obvious. 40 days in which to reassess what's important to us. Uh, personally, <clears throat> I don't like to talk about it as a time to give things up. I find that really a pretty unhelpful way to look at it. I prefer to see it as an opportunity to be kind to myself. Uh, as a detox for the soul, a chance to reboot the software, to reinstall health-giving practices for body and mind. And uh, in the weeks following my heart attack, I found myself putting my hand on my heart and apologising for the way that I treated it. I can't say that I've lived a perfect, heart-loving life ever since, though I do try. I try a hell of a lot more. and. You know, I'm three stone lighter than I was in 2010, so that's all part of it. But it's not just Lent. The short season of remembrance in uh, the October-November time, incorporating all saints, all souls, and Remembrance Sunday, invites us to face our mortality, to recognise that, yes, we are like grass, that none of us knows how long we'll be here. It's a time, perhaps, to embrace the understanding that life is more than these few years and uh, <clears throat> reevaluate what's important to us. And then there's Advent, this season, a season of waiting. And yet it's an opportunity to affirm, I believe, that waiting need never be mere waiting, simply hanging around. Being ill is, of course, a form of waiting, but lots of life involves waiting, waiting for the rain to stop, waiting for the sun to come out, waiting for the right job to come along for the right person to appear waiting in traffic one of my personal favorites not <laughs> waiting for a vaccination to arrive which thankfully it has life involves waiting it's unavoidable however it's up to us how we wait and that's the big thing isn't it uh, it's what advent is really all about i think learning to wait expectantly receptively not passively and and that requires patience Henry Nouwen says the word patience means the willingness to stay where we are and live the situation out to the full in the belief that something hidden there will manifest itself to us 
Impatient people, he says, are always expecting the real thing to happen somewhere else and therefore they want to go elsewhere. The present moment, therefore, is empty. But patient people, he says, dare to stay where they are. Patient living means to live actively in the present and wait there. So waiting is not passive. It shouldn't be. It involves nurturing the moment in the way that a mother nurtures the child that's growing within her. I suppose, uh, without being overly pious, which isn't something I'm too often accused of, <laughs> Advent waiting, any kind of waiting, provides a golden opportunity to listen to what God is saying in all of that. Well, I tell you this, I love what God is saying in the reading for the second Sunday of Advent from Isaiah chapter 40, which says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says God, the one who will feed his flock like a shepherd, who will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Deuteronomy Isaiah is just great, isn't he? Who Isaiah, I hear you say? Well, you know, the book of Isaiah is really three books, actually, with three different authors stitched together into one. No one knows who wrote this middle bit, chapters 40 to 55, so he's just been labelled Deutero Isaiah, which is just a way of saying second Isaiah. And actually, you know, I'm really sad that we don't know a lot more about this person because whoever he was, I'm, I'm a big fan. I'd say he's one of my favourite biblical writers, actually, because the God that he seems to know, um, the God he represents in his writings, is so wonderfully compassionate and generous, human in the very best sense of the term, a warm-hearted, loving God, which I, I can't say is true in all of the biblical writings. Did you know that Isaiah, second Isaiah, is the only book in the Bible that has God saying those three magical words, I love you. Yeah, it's true. It's the only place you'll find it. Isaiah 43 verse 4 says, You are precious in my sight and honoured, and I love you. Second Isaiah's God is a God who speaks tenderly, who restores peace to a people who've lost their way. It's actually addressed to a people, the people of Israel, who were in exile people in despair, people estranged by their circumstances as lots of folk around the world have felt estranged in 2020. The Israelites, of course, had a longer deal. I mean, they'd been in captive, uh, captive in Babylon for 40 years. Their temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was in ruins, dreams were shattered, home and some kind of normality, as we now like to say, felt a very long way off. Don't be afraid, God says. Don't be afraid, for I will strengthen you and I will hold you with my right hand. I have redeemed you. I know you by name. Can a mother forget her suckling child? Maybe, but I will not forget you. I am like a shepherd who gathers the lambs in my arms. This is this is a God I can relate to, I can believe in. This is This is a God of grace. Also in a time of despair and disappointment about stuff going on in the world, the wonderful Alice Walker wrote, It helps sometimes to look and see a flame-red bougainvillea climbing over the ledge down onto the deck. They can destroy the earth, she says, and take everything it has, but there will always be stubborn flowers climbing whatever walls are left. Stubborn flowers. I love that. Stubborn flowers. I think second Isaiah was something of a stubborn flower, a prophet of goodness and kindness, a voice of gentleness and hope. Uh, when everything around was alien and depressing, his voice was persistent. And I'd like to be a stubborn flower, wouldn't you? I hope I am, really. I hope I am, in my own way, a stubborn flower, keeping alive hope when the rubble of despair seems to be overwhelming, the rubble of a pandemic, the rubble of black and white religion my god an awful lot of people have got buried under that and a lot of us have found comfort in nature during this difficult year haven't we it's almost as if a close relative came to our rescue because you know the birds and trees um, 
this whole world of nature is in fact our family it's where we belong even though we frequently abuse it or at the very least forget about it and take it for granted but lockdown turned our attention toward nature in a rather wonderful way and I reckon Advent December is also a good time to slow down look around pay attention to our beautiful earth family to learn from its dogged presence you know its stubborn resistance in the face of the harshness and cold uh, of winter when I lay in my hospital bed recovering you know Pat brought me a copy of Mary Oliver's book Thirst uh, it's another collection of her poetry and uh, Mary L. Oliver was not just a nature lover she was certainly that but she was also a nature mystic because she actually fellowshiped with trees and flowers and birds and, and even even snakes uh, she she discovered God in nature she heard God's voice in nature let me read this one to you it's called when I'm among the trees when I'm among the trees especially the willows and honey locusts equally the beech the oaks and the pines they give off such hints of gladness I would almost say that they save me and daily I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world but walk slowly and bow often around me the trees stare in their leaves and call out stay a while the light flows from their branches and they call again it's simple they say and you too have come into this world to do this to go easy to be filled with light and to shine lovely stuff I would almost say that they save me and daily what is it that the trees save the poet from well she says it doesn't she from the distance or alienation that she sometimes experienced from her own inner hope from her own inner goodness and discernment they save her from not hurrying through the world in a constant blur learning instead to walk slowly and to bow often to go easy to be filled with light and to shine advent is about how we wait the man in the next bed to me you know when i was in hospital he'd also had a heart attack and you know what he spent most of his days <laughs> this is true running his business from his bed uh, you know you could hear him there shouting down the phone at a colleague so whoever demanding things getting himself in a right old state right there in the hospital bed recovering from a heart attack <laughs> you know it's not what happens to us that changes us for the better it's how we respond to what happens uh, as the small voice within stubbornly speaks telling us be comforted stop struggling stop trying to justify yourself stop trying to make things happen relax you're loved you're accepted you're precious not for who you might be but for who you are right now so uh, as you go about the rest of this period of December before Christmas have a peaceful advent and uh, be comforted Look after yourselves. Bye.